Steve, welcome back. Um, what is it we're going to talk about today then? Well, I thought we'd have a chat about ebooks. I mean, I did, dusted off my Kindle uh, the other day and I've been using that to read various things. So I thought it'd be, uh, it's about time we had a, a good chat about how ebooks work and the formats that are used for them. Brady and I did a video where we looked at the text formatting involved in making something look nice on an ebook reader. Oh, I think you pre-planned this. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We knew. But what we haven't talked about is how do you actually represent an ebook? How do you create the file format that's going to need? Can you just use something like PDF or HTML, which has been used before? Or do you need to create some sort of new file? So I thought what we'd do today is spend a few minutes just having a look at how ebooks work. So extremely recently, we made a video with Professor Altenkirk, who talked about using some um, software to convert a published format into an ebook format. We now have an electronic and ebook version of it. Is this the same kind of thing we're talking about today? Yeah, so I mean, th that software is going to produce uh, an EPUB file for certain ebook readers and um, a dot mobi file if it's going to something like a Kindle. So that's the sort of end result. What I want to talk about is actually how does that file, in particular, how does EPUB actually represent? The book. I mean, you might think this is straightforward. I mean, we've been printing documents pretty much since computers came along. Dave's covered things like PostScript and PDF and TROF before that, which have been around since the 60s, 70s and 80s in development. Um, why would ebooks be any different? I think the easiest thing to understand is if you think about how a book's produced. So when a book's produced, the writer comes up with whatever they want to write and they will then go and write it either by hand on a typewriter, hopefully into a word processor, and they will send the publisher that file to then go and create the file. So they will send the publisher, let's say, a Word document, and the publisher will see the manuscript from the author in whatever format they've used, and they will send that traditionally to an editor to sort of check that it actually is spelt correctly, that it does what it says on the tin and make any changes. Then once the editor and the author are happy with it, they will send it to a, a typesetter who will take the document, lay it out neatly to fit on the pages that are going to make up the book, and then they can send that to the printers to print the books, and it can be shipped to the shops or wherever to be distributed for us to read. And that's generally straightforward because all the books are the same size, the text is the same size in them. You might have a few variations and you might have a large print copy produced, you may have paperback and hardback, but you're probably going to have two or three different variants of it that will be produced, so you can easily typeset it, produce a nicely looking layout, and then send it off. What will often happen these days is that what will be received from the typesetter to the publisher to be sent to the printer is a PDF. And you might think, well, that's great. We can display PDFs on our Kindle, on our iPads. Why do we need to do anything else? Well, the problem is that, as we said, that PDF has been created for a certain page size, a certain book size, and we can view that on our device, but our device's size is likely to be different to that page size. I once spent a few minutes drawing out all the different devices, screen sizes I used to view documents electronically, and it was a, a vast different amount of sizes. So if we just use PDF, great as it is, and it displays the document brilliantly, then we would either have to scale it down so the text would become very, very small, or we'd have to sort of scan across it, scrolling between it. Anyone who used PDF in the late 90s, early 2000s will remember having to read documents online where you end up having to pan across the page to read it all, and in the end you just printed it out and read it off a piece of A4 paper because it was too much trouble. Fortunately, we've got higher resolutions and bigger monitors, so that problem's gone away to an extent. But in the ebook realm, we have that same problem. The Kindle has a, a screen size that's about that big. Um, the iPad is bigger than that. So one of the things they wanted with the formats that represent ebooks is that they want a format that can be displayed on any size screen. Still just have contain the book, but we can load it on this size screen and it displays to this side, or we can load it onto an iPad or an iPhone, uh, an Android phone, uh, whatever device you want to view it on, uh, even display it on your TV if that's what you wanted to do, and it would appear at the right size. So we couldn't just take PDF. Um, you might think, well, what about HTML? Well, HTML will rescale, we can resize our web browsers to be whatever size we want. But HTML doesn't have a concept of pages, and with ebooks, they're trying to sort of steal things that we're turning the pages and reading the document in a similar fashion. We don't just want a long scroll of the complete document. So, what they did was that they created new formats to describe a book specifically for display on an ebook reader, or specifically as electronic books. And these contain the document, but they contain it 
not like PDF or PostScript in its fixed final form, but in a form that can be resized to fit whatever display you're using. And in addition, if you wanted to, to include some interactivity, to have um, audio in there or video clips and so on to create the format. So it's designed to be able to be reflowed and resized to fit whatever device you want. And this is great because it means that if you've perhaps got a um, worsening eyesight, you can increase the size of the text to make it easier to read and so on. So you can sort of personalize how it looks for your own reading preferences. So, Steve, who's the they in this situation? It depends. I mean, on the Kindle, the they would be Amazon, who bought Moby Pocket, I think it was, many years ago, who developed the format that represents them. For everyone else, they use a format called EPUB, which is developed by a consortium of people who do that. And it contains people from Adobe and other companies that are interested in this. A bit like with HTML and the W3C group, a bit like with PDF and the ISO standard. There's various people, so they is a pretty good capsule to refer to. The people who are involved in creating these ebook standards, I think, is there's, there's a lot of people from various companies. Is there a sort of special source here? Are some people like, you know, guarding their way of doing it? Or is it fairly open and fairly, you know, tried and trusted techniques for this? Yes, I mean, EPUB's very open. You can go and download the uh, specifications. You can read through them. They're just like the, in fact, they're on the W3 website as well, just like the HTML stands and so on. So that's developed fairly open. Uh, Amazon's is Amazon's format. I think it is described, but it's not. It's developed for what Amazon need. I think it's probably the best way of putting it. So I think a good place to start is to actually just take a, an electronic book. In this case, I've got one called Beautiful Code, which is a, a collection of essays by various people, including Brian Kernahan, who's appeared on Computer File, describing bits of code that they found really, really interesting to look at. It's published by O'Reilly. It's been around for ages, but I happen to have both the physical copy in the office, which I can't get to at the moment, but also the electronic book format on my laptop. And I thought it'd be quite good just to actually have a look at the file and we'll open up the file and just see how it's created. Uh, and we'll see things that we're almost certainly familiar with in there. The first thing to say is that this, even though it says it's .epub, is actually just a zip file. It's just a standard zip file like any other zip file and we can extract that. So if I um, just use the command line, I've created a folder and I unzip that EPUB file, we'll see that it extracts a whole load of files that represent that book. And if we look at the things that we've got here, we'll see there's some .png files, which is some images. We'll see some .html files that represent the text. So I said before, you couldn't just use HTML uh, and you wouldn't want to use it on its own, but EPUB does use HTML um, to represent the pages. It's just standard XHTML to represent the pages. But there's other files alongside that that create the format. So just like a Word document or an Excel document these days and lots of other formats, an EPUB file, an electronic book, is just a zip file that contains all the things needed to make up that book. So what have we got? Well, we've got some various files for the open container format which are necessary, and these are the same if it's an EPUB file or a Word document. But the real interesting stuff is inside this folder here. There's a file in here. We can see all the HTML files and so on that represent the different chapters. So if I open up this chapter, we can see there's a pretty plain looking HTML file. This is the one I was saying by Brian Kernahan. It's about writing a regular expression matcher. Dave's been talking about regular expressions a lot. There's lots of stuff there. So that's just a standard file. What makes this an ebook and rather than just a standard file is that if we scroll down, we'll find that there's another file, which I shall open in a second. There's lots of chapters in this book and they've all been split up into sections. And we've got some fonts here as well. But there's this file here, content.opf. And this is the file that defines how the ebook is going to work. It's sort of like the sort of backbone of the ebook. Let me just open this into a text editor. This is the, the packaging format is perhaps the best way to describe it used for ePub. This, as we can see, is a version two ePub file. There is also uh, ePub 3 is the more modern standard, but a lot of the books still seem to be using ePub 2, probably for compatibility reasons. And if you don't need the extra features offered by ePub 3, it probably works pretty well just using EPUB 2. So yeah, EPUB 3 readers will be able to open an EPUB 2 file and so on. So what do we get in this document? Well, the first section inside the package is the metadata. And if we open that up, what we'll see is it just describes the book. So it includes things like the ISBN there. And this is using a previously existing format. It's RDF. It's using what's called Dublin Core to store the metadata. It's an XML representation of this. It's just a standard way of representing this data, so there's nothing 
Um, nothing new has been created here. A, a lot of the EPUB stuff is taking existing technologies and packaging them together to create this ebook format. The cleverness is in the software and the way it's then displayed to the user. The format's relatively straightforward, and you can grab the specs online. So we say what the title of the book is. In this case, it's Beautiful Code, uh, the copyright information, who's contributed to it, and so on, and et cetera. So that section's straightforward, and that can then be displayed perhaps on the title page of the book, and so on. The next section is what's called the manifest. And what this does is it describes every single, let's call it an asset, that's used inside the EPUB. Now, if you think about it, if we were doing this as a, on the web, we would just put the files on the server, and the server could then serve them. But EPUB has been designed to be a, a self-contained file that can be put, for the most cases, onto a device, and that device can then read the book without ever having to talk to the internet again. It may not even have a network connection. There's some exceptions in EPUB 3 for audio and video to be stored externally on the web. But in general, the EPUB expects all the files needed to be displaying it to exist within the package that it's being used that. And what happens here is we're defining all those files. And so we've got a reference to the actual file within the package, within the current directory in this case. So top.ncx is the first one. We can see the same for the different files that make up the document, the HTML files. And it defines what they are. It gives them an ID so they can be referred to elsewhere within this file. And it also specifies what their MIME type is so that the software knows how to understand it. What does MIME stand for? Just Yeah, so it's the multi-purpose internet mail extension. But one of the things it defines is a way of identifying each type of file in a way that's unique. And this is just so it knows what format to expect them when it's opening them. It can then use the right bit to go and get them out of the zip and open that file. The other bit we have, and this is the most interesting, and this is the bit that sort of ties in, if you think about a physical book, is a section called the spine. And what this does is it takes all the files, all the files that contain the, the content of the document, not the images and things which should then be referenced by those files, and it ties them into a specific order that you would appear as you read through the, the book. So you'd start off perhaps with chapter one, and then it would say this is chapter one, and that's followed by chapter two, and so on, and all the files that make up that order. So if we look at the spine, we will see that the first thing we've got is a reference to the cover. So we say we've got a reference to the item which is called cover, and if we look in the manifest, we will find that there is one of these called cover, which refers to cover.html, and then if we look at that file, we'd see that that represents the cover of the book. And then we have a whole series of other ID references, and in this case, they are not humanly readable. You could generate them automatically, as is the case here, or you could put chapter one, chapter two, whatever you wanted to do. But each of these will appear in the manifest to refer to the file. And when you open the ebook on your ebook reader, it will open the first one, and as you scroll through the pages, it will lay them out page after page after page. And then when you get to the end of whatever file that is, it will go on to the next file and lay them out page after page after the page, so you can swipe through the different chapters or whatever makes up this book. So the thing about this is this is defined how you read through the books and the default thing. It doesn't define how you would navigate through the book. So what we also get right at the top of the spine, and this is something where EPUB 2, which is the file we've got here, differs from EPUB 3, which is what came later. You'll see that on the actual spine element in the XML, we have a reference to the table of contents which is the file ncxtoc. If we look in the manifest, we'll see that's the first one. That that's a file, it's called toc.ncx, and it has a MIME type of application slash xdtbncx plus xml. What's going on here? Well, this is actually using an earlier standard, which was um, called DAISY, which was developed for producing audiobooks. So it's a, it's a file, the format for creating audiobooks, but it also contained a way of describing the table of contacts in there in a sort of XML format. And if we have a look at that file, we'll see this is another XML file that defines the table of contents. So it says the book's title is Beautiful Code. And then we have a, a navigation map that says we have a navigation point, which is this one, which is the first thing, has the title Beautiful Code, then content, another navigation point, and so on. And this defines a table of contents which the software could then render for it. This is one of the things that changed in EPUB 3, is that they actually, instead of using the DAISY format, they said, no, what we'll do is we'll store the navigation document 
using XHTML, using some of the new tags in HTML5, in this case the nav tag, so that you just define it as a, an XHTML document using a very precise subset of XHTML, it should be said in this case, that can then be loaded in by the EPUB reader to do the same sort of thing, and you tag it in the manifest as being the navigation file with a properties tag on there. But the actual layout of the document is just standard XHTML as we saw, so if I find chapter one again, we can bring that up and it's just standard text. You can use a lot of the features of HTML or XHTML when you're laying these things out, but certain aspects of CSS aren't necessarily supported by all ebook readers and so on. So you might probably want to look at the specs to make sure you choose the right ones that you use, but you can get some pretty good layout of it as we can see here. EPUB 3 extended this allowing things for animations, you can use SVG in there instead of HTML if you want to get a more fixed layout in certain sections and you can sort of sequence things so that some audio can play when you click get to part of the text or video styles starts at the same time and so on. Way before I had uh, any kind of ebook reader I remember reading a story about 1984 Big Brother ironically being or maybe it wasn't ironic being um, removed from people's ebook readers. I think it was Kindle at the time, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's a vague memory of, of thinking, wow, well, that's the ultimate big brother. You know, you're trying to read a book and then somebody takes it away from you. Uh, why and how does that happen? Yeah, I mean, I remember the, the exact story was 1984 on uh, the Kindle, I think, uh, although perhaps Fahrenheit 451 would be a more appropriate book for it to have happened. Whether we like it or not, and I, I think it's right, People who write books write it to support their families. They expect to be remunerated from it. And so the ebook formats do have support built into them to support digital rights management so that you can buy a copy of a book, but it's limited to you. So I can buy a book um, and read it, but if I send the file to you, you would not be able to open it. And the way that works is very straightforward within the file. The actual contents, the assets, the HTML files, the image files and so on, they're encrypted. Uh, using standard encryption technology and inside the ebook e package the person who's selling it to you so if this is Apple with their system on iBooks or Adobe with their bookstore can use their digital rights management to make sure you've got the key so that you can decrypt it but I can't then send it to someone else so that they can decrypt it and so on. So do they, do they alter the file for each book then? Is, it, is each book different or is it that they're literally giving you the keys with the book? Um, good question. I haven't delved into it in any detail, but I mean, there's two ways you could do it. You could encrypt the files um, using a key and then encrypt those keys within the file so that only you can decrypt the key to decrypt it. Um, or you could encrypt it specifically for the user. If you think about the way these are being distributed, they're being sent from a server to you, so it'd be very easy for the server to just go through and encrypt each of these files and create the, f uh, the encrypted file on the fly. As it does that so I imagine that that's what's happened certainly that's what happens with things like Apple's iTunes store when they were selling music that was encrypted uh, back in the early 2000s they encrypted it on the fly specifically for you or me or whoever's listening if these e publishing formats have got all these kind of flexible options and possibilities will they overtake and replace things like PDF so that's a, that's a good question um, will it replace the web will it replace PDF um, interesting question I mean it's been 10 years now that these have been on the, the field, I mean, I think I've bought my first ebook reader in 2009, 2010, if not earlier. Um, ebook sales have shot up, stagnated, perhaps dropped a bit. Maybe coronavirus will mean people prefer to buy uh, ebooks electronically rather than venture into a bookstore to buy a physical book covered in viruses. Interesting, we're now talking about the uh, computer version being safe from viruses and the physical one being. <laughs> Prone, <yeah. laughs> but I, I digress. Uh, yeah. But um, it hasn't yet. There's also, they, they do different things. So the advantage of PDF, you know what the author wrote and saw when they wrote it is what I'm seeing now. You've got that canonical representation that we've both seen. You don't get that with EPUB. And there are some cases where that is absolutely important. You can see it in the legal profession. Um, you can never replace PDF there with EPUB because it just would not be acceptable. And even perhaps with sort of the scientific and academic community things, People do want to change things away from PDF, but there is something to know that the document you're reading is what the author wrote, and you know that if that equation looks like that, that's what the author intended it to look like, even if it's wrong, rather than that that's how the software has interpreted it to. So I, I, I'm, 
I still think there's, there's space for both formats, and I think they both have their advantages. And interestingly, you are able to drop a PDF into an EPUB document to use it as an alternative representation. And you can reflow PDFs to a certain extent, but that's a story for another time. Right early on, you mentioned you could even put it on your TV. I remember being so into a book at one point, I was reading it on my phone, and I had a Chromecast in an Android phone, and I went to eat my lunch, and I, I cast the book onto the TV, <laughs> which we have on the wall in the kitchen, so I could eat my lunch, still reading the book. 